All right. Hi, folks. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Ben Clausen. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm one of our research managers here at CBRC, um, joining you from uh, Coast Salish territories, uh, specifically the home of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Stay with Tooth peoples. Um, it's my pleasure to get to moderate this panel today, uh, which is called Investigating and Responding to the Impacts of COVID-19, uh, where we'll be hearing um, about how to us LGBTQ plus folks in our communities have been experiencing and confronting the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just to give folks a bit of a sense of the format of the panel, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists uh, for each uh, presentation before we uh, do those respective presentations. Uh, and then we're gonna save all of the question and answer and discussion uh, for the end. Um, but we do encourage folks to uh, type questions into the chat as they come up, so uh, while they're fresh. Um, before we get started, uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, just wanted to remind folks about our community guidelines for the summit uh, to help ensure a safe, respectful, and inclusive experience for everyone. Um, and this includes respecting personal experiences and ensuring that we are sharing the space with other participants. Um, so you can please uh, check out the Summit 2022 page on our website um, for more information about those guidelines. Um, we also have a chat monitor um, who will be uh, helping to uphold those guidelines. Um, we understand that some of the content and discussions may be difficult to hear uh, and encourage any participant in need to access our counseling support. And you can do this by going to the Summit Participant Directory, which is located on the conference platform. Um, where you'll see a counseling coordinator listed. And that coordinator will help connect you with a counselor uh, for an informal uh, active listening and supportive session uh, if you need that. So as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to post your questions or comments into the chat box, uh, and we'll be holding all questions until after uh, all three of the panelists' presentations. Uh, we only have three panelists, uh, so we should have a lot of time for question and discussion if we want to have that. Um, there is also uh, automated closed captioning available in both English and French, uh, and we're recording today's session uh, and we'll be publishing it on the conference platform uh, in the coming days. So don't feel like you have any need to record the session yourself. Um, we'll also be asking for some feedback uh, via an evaluation form at the end of the session. Uh, so you can scroll down to the page, the bottom of the page, uh, and select the evaluations button uh, when we get to the end of the session. So uh, with all of those formalities out of the way, um, I'm going to introduce our first uh, group of presenters um, who are presenting on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of LGBTQ plus people, a scoping review. Um, so uh, Christopher Dietzel is a research associate on the Impacts Project and also works in the Sexual Health and Gender Lab or the SHAG Lab. Uh, Dr. Dietzel's research explores the intersections of gender, sexuality, health, safety, and technology. Recently, his interests have centered around issues of consent and sexual violence, particularly related to mobile apps and LGBTQ plus people. Uh, Brittany Machette, she, her, is the research coordinator for the Shag Lab at Dalhousie, Dalhousie University and holds both an undergraduate and master's degree in health promotion. Her research interests include the intersections between gender and health, sexualized violence, and examining how rape culture and rape myths are institutionally and socially constructed. Uh, next, uh, Bamadeli Bello, uh, she, her, is a Kilm postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University. She received her doctoral degree in public health from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, she has been researching reproductive health for more, more than 10 years and has a deep passion for adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And finally, uh, Jesse Cullum, she, her, is a fourth year undergraduate student in health promotion from Dalhousie University. Her undergraduate honors work investigates the link between environmental exposures and preconception health. Jesse's research interests uh, include maternal health, the health of LGBTQ plus populations, and the relationship between uh, the environment and sexual health. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenters. 
Thank you, Ben, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, so yes, hello, my name is Chris Dietzel, uh, and I'm excited to be here with everyone today to have our presentation about the mental health of LGBTQ plus people during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a scoping re review that I conducted along with my colleagues, Dele, Brittany, and Jesse, who are with us today. Next slide, please. So to just give you a bit of information about this project, uh, this is a project that was funded, that is funded by the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation. And uh, we began this research about a year ago. And the intent of this project is that we wanted to look, is that we want to look at how the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced the mental health of 2S LGBTQ plus people in Nova Scotia, specifically the 2S LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus people who use dating apps. Uh, and we want to look at the strategies that they employ to manage their mental health during the pandemic. So uh, for this project, we have divided our research into two main areas. First is that we're going to be conducting a mixed method survey. And then following that survey, we're going to be doing qualitative interviews. In order to inform this research, what we wanted to first do is gain an understanding of what knowledge, uh, what is known about the mental health of 2S LGBT plus people. And so for this reason, we decided to do a scoping review and the results uh, those results we're gonna share with you today. So specifically our scoping review aims to answer the question, how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact the mental health of LGBTQ plus people? So before we discuss how we conducted our scoping review and outline our key findings, I wanna give a brief overview of our topic. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, LGBTQ plus people experienced poor mental health outcomes in both mental health diagnosis and mental health symptoms compared to heterosexual and cisgender people in Canada. The COVID-19 pandemic further intensified this existing gap. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic caused strain to pre-existing social and structural issues, causing minority populations to be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. This idea has been suggested to be associated with minority stress theory, which means that minority groups experience pre-existing high levels of stress, meaning that during periods of crisis, such as during the COVID-19 pandemic, minority groups such as LGBT plus people are at higher risk of experiencing greater harm. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of the methods that we used for this research. So we followed Arxian O'Malley's 2005 five-step approach for scoping reviews. Our search strategy was created in consultation with a health sciences librarian from Dalhousie University around three broad topic areas, LGBTQ plus people, the COVID-19 pandemic and mental health. The search strategy was then employed across six databases to generate the most relevant results, academic search premiere, APA Psych Info, Gender Studies, Sociological Abstracts, PubMed, and Embase. Uh, once we had pulled the studies from these six databases, articles were then screened in Covidence, which is an online software used for data management. And articles were included if they met the following inclusion criteria. Having been peer reviewed and published since 2020, published in the English language, although we had no limit on geographic location, included LGBTQ plus people and adults aged 18 years or older as either the main participant population or as the subpopulation. And if they did not focus on external factors or predictors of mental health, such as family relations or alcohol or substance use. I'll be giving us an overview of the studies included in the scoping review. In total, we had 61 studies in our scoping review, and majority of them used the quantitative methods. Five were mixed methods, and seven were qualitative studies. Most of the studies that we reviewed were conducted in North America and other developed countries, and the majority of them used the con Sorry, I'm being cut off. Can you hear me? The majority of them or use the cross-sectional approach and 16 compared pre-pandemic data to data collected during the pandemic. Uh, of the mental health studies as topics researched, depression and anxiety were the most researched in all the 61 studies that we assessed. And uh, depression were assessed by more than half of the studies and same with anxiety, while stress or psychological distress were assessed by over a third of the studies. Other mental health topics assessed were loneliness, social support, well-being, suicidal ideation, self-harm, 
COVID-related fears and coping strategies? So the first theme that I would like to talk about uh, is looking at the general effects of the pandemic on LGBT plus people's mental health. So overwhelmingly, we found that LGBT plus people experienced greater negative mental health outcomes than cisgender and heterosexual people. Across all our studies, we found that there was an increase in depression, anxiety, and stress or distress uh, in this population. And just to give you an idea of uh, what, how those, uh, how de depression, anxiety, and stress uh, increased amongst LGBTQ plus people. Uh, there was a study that found that a couple studies that found risks of depression uh, were about two to three times higher among LGBTQ plus people. There was one study that estimated that about two in three LGBTQ plus people experienced anxiety during the pandemic. And another study found that about one in two LGBTQ plus people experienced moderate to severe psychological distress. Uh, it's also, despite the overwhelming number of studies that did find that LGBTQ plus people experienced greater negative mental health outcomes, uh, there were a few studies that did not find significant difference in the mental health outcomes of LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus people and non-LGBTQ LGBT, plus people. For example, there was one study that found that MSM who identify as heterosexual actually had higher psychological distress than MSM who had MSM being men who have sex with men. Uh, so there was this one study that found that MSM who identifies heterosexual actually had higher psychological distress than the MSM who identify as homosexual. Our second theme that we found was uh, the specific mental health consequences that were experienced by LGBTQ plus people as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So depressive symptoms among LGBTQ plus people increased sixfold when compared to pre-pandemic data. And this was our largest increase in depressive symptoms that we found during our study. LGBTQ plus people's anxiety was found to be highest in the first few months of the pandemic. And some factors that imp impacted this high rate of anxiety was if individuals lived with their parents, if they were worried about being infected with the COVID-19 virus, or if they were essential workers. Um, lack of social support was four times as likely to impact LGBTQ plus people's mental health compared to heterosexual or cisgender counterparts. And quality of life and life satisfaction declined among LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus people during the pandemic. Suicidality and self-harm were also common findings among our study. Um, one in four LGBTQ plus people reported having suicidal thoughts, which was the highest prevalence of suicidal ideation that we uncovered in this review. One in three LGBTQ plus people had hurt themselves or had thoughts about hurting themselves during the pandemic. And rates of suicidal ideation among LGBTQ plus people were twice as high as among heterosexual people. Another important thing that came out from our study is the differences between LGBTQ plus people. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on LGBT plus people varied based on their gender and sexual orientation. Particularly, we found that bisexual people's mental health was more negatively impact, impacted by the pandemic compared to other LGBT plus people. Interestingly, uh, those who identified as gay and lesbians were found to have the least negative impact. Similarly, transgender, non-binary, and uh, gender diverse people we found that they experienced worse mental health during the pandemic when compared to their cisgender counterparts. Transgender women, for example, reported the greatest decline in mental health. Also, trans feminine people, uh, we found that they were more likely to report depression and anxiety related to trans masculine and non-binary people. Again, intersectionality helped us to uncover mental health outcomes relative to LGBT plus people's other identities, and notably indigeneity, we found that it was negatively related to mental health outcomes. In our review, several protective and risk factors were identified, meaning specific factors that studies found have direct benefits or harms towards someone's mental health. Personal and social relationships, for example, were found to have a strong predictor of mental health outcomes during the pandemic. One study found that being in a romantic relationship um, during periods of lockdown increased mental health outcomes um, versus people who were single during this time. Ties to LGBTQ communities, um, supports, and groups were also found to increase mental health outcomes um, in LGBTQ plus people. 
Family re relationships and at-home support was also found to have um, a very high impact on mental health outcomes during the pandemic, specifically people who identified um, having complex or toxic family environments and who were locked down with their families during this time um, reported significantly lower mental health outcomes than individuals who reported that they had supportive families who were very supportive of their identity and um, orientation. Um, they tend to have higher mental health outcomes during the pandemic. Online technologies were also found to be a protective factor. Um, many studies found that LGBTQ plus people use social media and dating apps to manage their mental health and as a tool to stay connected to their friends and families during the pandemic. Lack of access to health services was a major, major risk factor um, for negative mental health outcomes. This was particularly um, relevant for transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse people who found that accessing gender-affirming health care during the pandemic was increasingly difficult or the services were suspended um, altogether, um, had a significant um, decrease in mental health outcomes. Substance use was also frequently cited as a coping mechanism. Um, studies found that LGBTQ people consumed more alcohol than heterosexual people during the pandemic. Um, and LGBTQ people who increased their substance use during the pandemic um, typically had higher mental distress than LGBTQ people who's, uh, who did not use substances during the pandemic or whose substance use remained the same during this time period. In conclusion, our key findings were that LGBTQ plus people, they suffered adverse mental health outcomes, uh, particularly when we compare them to non-LGBTQ plus people. Again, we also found that bisexual, pansexual, demisexual, asexual, trans and non-binary and gender diverse people were more negatively impacted by the pandemic when we compared them to other LGBTQ plus people. Uh, the lockdown that was instituted to control the spread of pan the pandemic, we found out that it limited the access of LGBTQ plus species, and it caused many of the LGBTQ plus people to be locked out of their social venues where they felt more comfortable. And uh, in most cases, they were locked in with family members and uh, or in, in other non-supportive environments. Uh, no studies found negative relationship between technology and LGBTQ plus people's mental health. And uh, we found a lack of healthcare services and lack of access to healthcare services were significant sources of distress for the transgender and the trans and gender diverse people, as well as other LGBTQ plus people that had pre-existing mental health challenges. So at this point, we want to leave you with a few recommendations, recognizing that many of you work in, in the community sector and many of you are uh, might be front facing uh, on might be front facing or work on the front lines. First, we suggest that uh, you tailor your support services. So if you have not done so already, uh, our findings show that uh, people with diverse gender identities and sexual orientations have different needs. And so we need to make sure that those needs are taken into consideration uh, when providing health care uh, and giving support in social situations. Second, it's important to recognize diversity among LGBT plus people. We often tend to think of LGBT plus as a, a unified community. And while there are certainly similarities in people's experiences, our, our results uh, showed that uh, there were big differences in how the pandemic impacted subpopulations of the LGBT plus umbrella. Uh, so it impacted different people differently. So we need to keep this in mind and make sure that uh, we're not providing the same type of care to all LGBT plus people. Um, and as Dele just mentioned, you know, there were certain populations that uh, had worse mental health outcomes. Uh, also, in terms of recognizing diversity, we, we would like to emphasize that diversity in this case does not only refer to sexual and gender orientation or sexual identity and gender, uh, but it also refers to other uh, other factors that are related to people's identities, such as race, ethnicity, indigeneity, class, immigration status, as well as many other uh, socio sociological and demographic factors that can impact people's mental health. 
Another recommendation that we have is to use technology. Um, as Dele just mentioned, none of the studies found that there were negative connections between LGBT plus people's mental health uh, and the pandemic. Quite the contrary, we found that uh, LGBT, LGBTQ plus people relied on online platforms like social media and dating apps to manage their mental health. So we encourage you to use technology as, as a means to engage in outreach uh, and provide services and, uh, and support to people uh, in the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community. Lastly, in terms of a recommendation, uh, recognizing both that the COVID-19 pandemic is ongoing and that monkeypox has been uh, an emerging health issue, uh, particularly for people uh, who identify as LGBTQ plus, um, we should learn from these issues uh, and really take the time now to, to recognize that there could be, I mean, hopefully there won't be future pandemics, but nonetheless, uh, we should learn from what worked and what didn't work during these last couple of years and take this opportunity to improve our services uh, to ensure that uh, we are doing the best that we can uh, to support the health, safety, and security of LGBTQ plus people. Lastly, um, I'm just gonna outline some implications for future research avenues based on our findings. So future research should examine the impacts of the pandemic on LGBTQ plus youth. Um, it should also attempt to investigate the long-term mental health outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it should consider how online technologies can be used as either protective factors and or risk factors for individuals' mental health. And this is actually how we plan to move forward with our project, with the next steps of our project, which will examine 2S LGBTQ plus people's mental health and their use of online technologies such as dating apps and social media during the pandemic. This research will take a more intersectional approach, analyzing how other identities, other than being part of the LGBTQ plus community, factor into people's mental health, such as race and ind indigeneity. And it will also give us insight into a broader range of experiences um, through the use of our survey, as well as more in-depth experiences through the interview component. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation today. We would like to thank our PI, Dr. Matthew Neumer, who is the founder of the Sexual Health and Gender Research Lab at Dalhousie University. We'd also like to thank um, the funding by Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation, who has made this research possible. And we are happy to take any questions that you may have, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again. Thanks folks for the great first presentation. Uh, already getting us thinking intersectionally about COVID-19 impacts, which I think will be coming up uh, a lot more in some of the other presentations. So um, I just as a reminder to folks, we're gonna hold questions until the end. Uh, but if you do have questions as the present uh, presentations kind of go on, please just type them into the chat and we'll make sure that we get to them um, at the end of the presentations. So uh, next up, we have uh, Kenny Chi, who's presenting on uh, intersectional experience of queer Asian youth and impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I have the pleasure of getting to introduce Kenny, uh, he, him, uh, who is a PhD student at the Community Psychology Program at the Wilfrid Laurier University uh, under the supervision of Dr. Todd Coleman. Um, so Kenny's research interests are on the well-being of marginalized youth uh, through an intersectional lens. And Kenny is a queer Chinese born uh, person and raised in uh, Malaysia and currently lives in Toronto. Um, so Kenny, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. Alrighty. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I think this flow very perfectly as I am the future research of the previous presenters because <laughs> I'm like focusing on the intersectional identities among queer Asian Canadian youth and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just let me... Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we gather here today on a traditional lands of many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And I'm currently residing in Toronto, which is the traditional lands of the Huron, one day the Seneca, and the Mississauga to credit. A bit about myself, um, in terms of my social location, I'm a third generation of Chinese immigrants in Malaysia. Uh, I was born and raised there, as I, that's uh, been mentioned, and a first generation of Malaysian Chinese immigrants in Canada. Uh, and I'm queer and cisgender male and who uses um, 
he, him pronouns. In terms of my educational and, and, and community background, I have years experience working frontline with marginalized youth. I used working with um, youth experience homelessness since 2016. And I completed my Bachelor of Degree in Psychology at the University of Manitoba in 2017. I completed my Master of um, Arts degree in Community Psychology at Yofi Laurier University in 2022. And currently a PhD student in Community Psychology program at Yofi Laurier University. Okay, let's dive into it. I will start by um, with a quote from a, a scholar named Kristen Kumashiro. Um, Asian American youth face racialized heterosexism and in Asian American communities and queer racism in the queer communities. As a quote indicated, the queer Asian in North America face twofold challenges queer racism and racial heterosexism. Indeed, Asian culture plays a lot of uh, high importance on traditional female scripts and obligation. Thus, LGBTQIA plus identities was seen undesirable because it disrupted the idea of family payty. Concurrently, they face queer racism within a queer community, such as fetishizations and rejection because of their race. Then the COVID-19 pandemic emerged in 2020, which created more complex challenges for queer Asian youth. The restriction limited youth access to community spaces of safe heaven from home and forced the youth to stay home more with their unsupportive parents at the same time. Additionally, the increased hate crimes against Asian due to the pandemic also spiked. Heterosexism and queer racism have negatively, negatively impacted queer Asian youth mental health, which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the urgency of alleviating the mental health crisis, there's a lack of inclusive support for queer Asian youth due to the modern minority myth, and the most of the support system lacking cultural sensitivity as they tend to be very white dominated. So what's lacking and missing in the literature? We lack research on intersectional experiences of queer Asian youth and the mental health navigation experience in Canada. Despite us growing research on Asian well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic, the research on LGBTQIA plus Asian well-being is sparse, especially when queer Asian youth are experiencing more complex challenges compared to the cisgender and straight counterparts. Thus, this research is to explore the intersectional experience of queer Asian youth in Canada, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we know what's missing and what's available out there based on the literature. I generally generated my research questions by using my theoretical framework with these three theories and models. The theoretical, theoretical framework also informed and guided my data analysis process. Um, first is the Asian critical race theory proposed by Musa Invistgar in 2014. The theory is derived from the critical race theory to put the emphasis on Asian American experience in a white dominated discourse. I apply this theory to explore queer Asian experiences in a Canadian context. However, the Asian Creed theory mostly focuses on intergroup dynamics and omitted the intra-community factors, such as LGBTQIA plus stigmas within Asian communities. Thus, I feel in um, with the integrative models of stress and trauma of LGBT, LGBTQIA plus Asian proposed by Ching and colleagues in 2018. The integrative model derived from minority stress model created by Myers to look at the unique experience of LGBTQIA plus Asian experience. There are different components such as microaggression, structural oppression in the model that interact to create pathway to affect one mental health outcomes. And one of the uh, one of the pathway components are social support, which I chose to integrate the construct of community belongingness proposed by Hudson in 2015. Um, there are four dimensions in the community belongingness model. So the first one is being close, which is which means that it's a close proximity and spaces among the members. And being seen is they're having a representation in a community. Being heard is the notion of whether they have the power to influence and challenge the status quo, or having a conversation with someone with shared lived experiences. And being read is the notion of whether the outsider validate or understand the person's identities. And all of this will interact with lead to being well, which is um, positive well-being. So informed by the theoretical framework and the review, I generated three research questions. Um, the first one would be, how has the intersection of discrimination and our experiences of microaggression impacted LGBTQIA plus Asian youth mental health? How has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted LGBTQIA plus Asian youth in relation to the intersectional identities? And third would be, be how do intracategorical identities, so being queer and Asian, sh um, shape the experience of um, LGBTQIA plus Canadian Asian youth seeking for support? This study is mixed method design. Um, specifically, I use concurrent embedded mixed method approach in which quantitative data embedded in the qualitative data. 
In terms of the quanti quantitative component, I have asked the participants to fill out three different skills. The first would be depression, anxiety, stress skills to explore their mental health statuses. Then I asked the participants to fill out the LGBT, BIPOC, micro microaggression skills and an intersectional discrimination index to explore their intersectional experience with discrimination, including microaggressions. Then the participants fill out some demographic questions. And informed by the community belongingness by Hudson's, I utilized focus group discussion to capture the qualitative data. The utilization of the focus group discussion is to put the emphasis on the peer interaction and a connection among, among the participants. I facilitated a total of eight focus groups between November and March 2022, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, with a total of 30 par participated with three to six participants in each focus group. Then I started with the transcription um, and data analysis, and I transcribed the focus group by using otter.ai, which is an online transcription too. I will read the focus group discussion and listen to the audio at the same time to ensure the accuracy of the transcription. Then I analyzed the quantitative data by using SPSS and followed by Brown and Carter and six, six steps of thematic analysis on NVivo on the for the qualitative data. After all the thematic analysis completed, I conducted member checking in May 2022 with eight participants by presenting them the themes and asked them if, if those themes accurately reflected their narrative and experiences. All right, um, so in terms of participant demographic, the average age of the participants 24.33, ranging from, from 17 to 27. Most of the participants identify as Southeast Asian, including Malaysian, Malaysian Chinese, Vietnamese, Indonesian, and Filipino, followed by Chinese. And most participants identify as gay, followed by bisexual and queer. And most participants also identify as cis women, followed by cis men. In terms of the locations participants are from, they are from across Canada. Um, most of them are from Toronto, followed by Vancouver and Winnipeg. Um, other cities included, but not limited to Regina, Saskatchewan, Brampton, Guelph, Waterloo, Halifax, Markham, and so forth. For the quanti quantitative data, participants score relatively high in the stress, depression, anxiety scales. And based on the characterization outlined by the lobby bond, lobby bond, in average, the participant scores were in the extreme category for stress, anxiety, and depression. I further conducted an exploratory Pearson correlation to examine how this construct were related. All of them were significantly correlated, meaning that the higher intersection of discrimination and microaggression, the higher the participant score in, a, uh, in depression anxiety. However, for stress, the microaggression was marginally correlated with stress. Now, next, we're gonna dive into the qualitative findings based on the research questions. So research question one focuses on the intersectional experiences of the queer Asian youth. Participants discuss how they navigate, navigated themselves in both Asian communities and queer communities. Um, consistent with the previous literature, when participants navigating, navigating themselves in the queer communities, they talked about their experiences with interpersonal relationships, so that would include rejections and fetishizations. When participants talk about being queer in the Asian communities, they talk about their queer identity with their parents, whether they want to live their authentic, authentic self or honor their parents and their extended, extended family. For instance, Audrey felt um, her, her parents would rather her not get married than married to a woman, and Nathan felt that he wants to continue to honor his parents by not coming out to them. At the same time, participants also felt that heteronormativity is prevalent in their daily life. Elisa expressed that Asian culture put all the emphasis on traditional gender scripts, such as marrying a good wife, find a rich husband. Some participants also have to dodge questions when they ask about their relationship statuses when in a family gathering. I also briefly explore how other identities intersect to create a more complex intersectional experience among the youth. For example, being fat, mixed, and immigrants can create more complex challenges when navigating the queer and Asian identities. So overall, participants felt disconnected from both queer and Asian communities, which have a very great impact on their mental health. However, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated their mental health outcomes, which I will touch on in the next few slides. So in terms of the uh, research questions too, which focuses on the COVID-19 uh, impact, unexpectedly participants indicated they were able to use the restrictions to pause and reflect about their life. For example, participants were able to explore their hobbies, career path, as well as they're able to use the opportunity to explore their sexual orientation, gender identities, and expression. For instance, Erin here was able to explore their gender expression and identity during the pandemic. 
However, participants felt that they were stuck at home and that access to community resources were limited due to the restrictions. As a result of being inside home more, participants felt that their privacy has been compromised, which led to increased conflicts and tension with their family members, and this could negatively impact their mental health. Another theme that came up is the in increased hate crimes against Asians due to the pandemic. Um, participants expressed they felt very unsafe for themselves and their family members, especially if their parents are in a community. Some participants exper experienced direct racism as well. For instance, um, participants were called slurs when in the communities and online. Um, to avoid being targeted in public, um, some, participant, some participants modified their behavior to minimize standing out. So for example, participants avoided coughing and sneezing to avoid assumptions that carried the virus. And some participants were even worried about speaking Mandarin in public. Another thing that came up in the finding is the emergence of the Stop Asian Hate Movement. Overall, the participants felt that the movement was empowering as they felt that the movement allowed people to start recognizing that the structural harm that Asian community uh, um, had been experiencing has been recognized. However, on the other side of the coin, participants felt that the movement is rather performative and lacking its impact to be transformative. And most importantly, um, participants felt that the movement was not inclusive and omitted the intersectional aspects of Asian, particularly queer Asians' voices. Now I'm going to move on to um, the third research question, which focuses on the youth experiences in mental health navigations. Um, participants expressed that they rely on their friends for mental health support and other BIPOC support system. As a result, most of the support system um, tend to be very white dominated, which do not necessarily have the knowledge to address the unique needs of queer Asian youth. And participants also um, express that they often encounter microaggression in these supposedly safe spaces. Participants also expressed that having queer Asian spaces and representation in the media can help with their self-affirmation as a queer Asian. And having this representation in spaces can facilitate a journey of discovery. Okay, what can we take away from this study to inform the communities? So first we need more spaces for queer Asian to hang out, socialize and support. As participants expressed that queer Asian spaces are lacking, especially in the smaller cities and rural areas. Having queer Asian spaces can be very important and beneficial for their self-exploration and discovery and healing. The peers' interaction within the focus group yield benefits, which suggests that an int intentional safe space can be very beneficial for the youth. Participants also express that the reason why some programs are not sustainable because of the lack of funding and resources, Thus, more funding is needed for queer Asian to create spaces for themselves, such as, such as providing um, education for the community members and community outreach within the Asian communities. Institutions such as LGBTQIA plus group in the university and GSA in high school should be ensure its, its inclusivity for queer Asian and be aware of micro microaggression and discrimination which may occur in those spaces. We also definitely need more cultural competent support system that effectively address the intersectional needs of queer Asian youth, such as having BIPOC-led and queer Asian-led support groups, and mental health professionals should further enhance their skills, such as learning more about unique intersectionality of being queer Asians and how to effectively support queer Asian youth. To conclude, the participants in the study expressed that, dual, that they are experiencing dual, dual exclusion of, from the both communities, so i.e. queer and Asian communities, which have a significant impact on their mental health. And then the COVID-19 pandemic um, exacerbated their mental health outcomes through a variety of factors, so including feeling isolated from communities and being stuck at home with unsupported parents, and also the increased hate crimes against Asians. Thus, we need to have inclusive mental health support for queer Asian youth now than ever. As this is a very tense conversation to have, um, I would like to wrap this up in a positive note by sharing the quote from participants to light up the mo mood. So, I would say it's okay that we don't, don't really know how it fit in with being queer and Asian because just by existing, it helps enrich the world. By embracing our own uniqueness, even if we do not fully understand what that means to us or to other people, we can help build each other up through our understanding or lack of understanding of what exactly each of us have been through. So even if our identities are the way they intersect and the things that they are not fully understood by the mainstream, and we do not see enough represent representation of who we are, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be proud of who, how we identify or the steps that we're making to figure that out. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Kenny. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Um, I think definitely gesturing towards how COVID-19 has exasperated some existing health inequities in our communities. And I think we're gonna have a really great conversation um, at the end of all of these presentations because it sounds like there's some really, some strong threads here that we can pull out. Um, so uh, last but certainly not least uh, for our presenters um, is Ezra Black, uh, who will be presenting on health work and COVID-19 how GBMSM uh, managed their sexual health during the pandemic. Uh, so Ezra, they, them, is a queer, non-binary, 2SLGBTQ plus researcher, counselor, and registered social worker from Toronto, Ontario, uh, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, they received their master's of social work degree from the University of Toronto, uh, and they've worked as a peer researcher with Daniel Grace, uh, at the Dalalana School of Public Health uh, since March 2020. Uh, their primary research interests involve all things to us LGBTQ plus health, uh, from facilitating access to creating innovative solutions that enhance the health and well-being of these diverse communities. Um, so Ezra, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go share my screen. Uh, where is the screen? There you go. Okay, actually, there you go. Everyone can see my screen, correct? I'm assuming yes. Alrighty, so um, hello again, everyone, Ezra Black here. Um, I'm doing my um, presentation on health work in COVID-19 and how the pandemic has affected uh, gay, bi, queer, and other men who have sex with men um, in primarily Ontario. Um, and this work is based off of a manuscript that I'm currently trying to edit and get published. Um, so fingers crossed that that happens very soon. Um, and I also want to just give an acknowledgement and shout out to the wonderful uh, co-authors and teammates who have been so supportive in this project, um, particularly Max Stewart, Kiho Ryu, Abdi Hassan, Joshin Delay, Pranay Anand, uh, Mark Gilbert, and Daniel Grace. Um, and so I don't want to do a quick land acknowledgement here, um, just to say that the land that I am standing on today is known as Toronto, most commonly known as Toronto. And for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty uh, between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the land, its waters, and all the biodiversity in the Great Lakes region. So as we work, live, and play on this land, we are all responsible for honoring this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And as treaty people, we all have a collective responsibility to continually engage, learn, and reflect in a decolonized matter. So uh, Takarano is still home today to many of the diverse Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and myself, others, and I can say for all of us here in Ontario, are incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and play on this land. There you go. Yeah, so like I said before, this presentation is based on my research manuscript that is titled, It's a lot of figuring out on your own, COVID-19 impact on the health work among gay, bisexual, queer, and other men who have sex with men in Ontario, Canada. Uh, a collaborative endeavor with the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health Research at the Dalai Lama School of Health, housed at the University of Toronto. So a bit of background of how this uh, project kind of came to be. Uh, essentially, sexual health service providers in Ontario had to significantly reduce uh, their uh, staff and their services or to seize their operations entirely due to the COVID-19 pandemic um, early on in 2020, to be specific. Um, and so service reductions in these closures severely impacted the health and well-being of cisgender and transgender, gay, bisexual, and uh, queer men who have sex with men. Um, but in particular, these disruptions uh, have particularly impacted um, gay, bisexual, queer men who have sex with men's health work. What is health work, though? because I'm sure some people may have an idea, may not have heard of it before, but it's essentially the activities that people do to maintain their physical, social, mental, sexual, uh, and spiritual health and well-being. And I also want to give a 
shout out to just the important legacy that this concept has uh, had over the past 20 or so years. Um, so the concept of health work follows this legacy in community work, activism, and critical social science research in Canada, um, particularly in solidarity with people living with HIV um, or AIDS. So some notable people uh, that you can see on the list here in some of the essential readings, if you will, um, are Eric Michalowski, Lisa McCoy, George W. Smith, and many others who have pioneered this work uh, since the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and now a new generation of researchers such as Apondi Ogambodede, Eodeji Ogan Ratifa, and myself um, have taken the reins to continue this legacy. Um, and given this history of the concept, uh, you know, health work is still especially relevant today, uh, especially for the communities that we serve. And it can also look like a lot of different things, right? So an examples of health work can be finding appropriate doctors who are knowledgeable on uh, trans and queer health, uh, educating doctors on HIV, sexuality, or gender, making and taking time, so like actually making and going to your appointment, um, managing medication adherence, the role of personal experience, the social circumstances of daily life that affect health management, reading, learning, and assessing health information, and establishing regimens around health and well being. Uh, so, this project is part of a larger study that has been conducted in both British Columbia and Ontario. Um, and it primarily is looking um, at the Get Checked Online service, which is an internet-based testing service for sexually transmitted, transmitted and bloodborne infections, STBBI for short. And this larger study aims to understand how organizations can roll out and improve Get Checked Online or other online sexual health services. Um, and the findings from this larger project um, hopefully is to uh, inform the strategic adaptation of Get Checked Online's current service characteristics to better serve the diverse uh, community and needs of the 2S LGBTQ community, um, but particularly for gay, bi, queer, and other men who have sex with men in the greater Toronto area. Um, so this project is also meant to offer some insight into the service user and service provider context of sexual health services and to continually and equitably grow um, digital health initiatives. And the main objective for my manuscript um, is essentially to explore how uh, G gay, bi, queer, and other men who have sex with men um, manage their sexual health routines and related act activities during the pandemic, particularly the early onset, so early 2020 going into 2021. Um, and really what we hope to get out of this project is that it supports researchers, policymakers, and service providers in increasing service accessibility um, for this community while decreasing the amount of labor required to access and manage care in this new sexual health landscape. So some pieces on data collection here. We conducted semi-structured uh, qualitative interviews and focus groups in two different phases. In phase one, this took place during June to September 2020, where we had eight focus groups of around six or eight people and four interviews uh, conducted with individuals. And because we noticed in our phase one, there were a lot of um, participants who were predominantly uh, white and cisgender, uh, we wanted to expand and get more of a story from the folks we have not really got a chance to spoken to speak with yet. So in phase two, uh, which took place from August to December 2021, we had uh, three additional focus groups and four interviews specifically with Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, just to ensure that we were getting a diverse uh, range of experiences being told uh, for our study. And the eligibility criteria for um, this project is that they had to be at least 18 or older, um, identify as uh, gay, bi, queer, um, men who have sex with men who are either cisgender or transgender, have received an STBBI or HIV test um, or access those services within the past year, um, have had anal 
oral, vaginal, or front hole sex. Um, in the past year, the they live, work, and play um, in Ontario are able and willing to participate in a focus group in English. And because we did these uh, focus groups and interviews virtually, which was a lovely time to try to transition over to, um, participants will also have to be willing to participate using an online platform. Um, in this case, we used MS Teams and Skype eventually in the second half. Um, our sample size was 39. Um, and we wanted to have these focus groups in particular to remain aligned with community-based research principles. So we can think of the not about us without us slogan, uh, collaboration, authentic engagement and involvement with our community, um, as well as trying to elicit empowerment for folks to share their stories and experiences and also take part in the study as well um, in other facets. And service users were predominantly asked to reflect on their experiences accessing STVBI testing services in Ontario and also discuss the acceptability and relevant context uh, for using an online STBBI service like GCO. And from this work, we had found uh, three themes that have impacted, uh, or rather three themes that talk about the impacts of the health work among this population. So uh, it remains around challenges in accessing the health services themselves, changes in sexual health service preferences and practices, as well as trying to traverse both the barriers and facilitators to care via online platforms. So for the first theme, we're looking at the difficulty or rather the challenges in accessing the services. And this one looks at difficulties in booking appointments due to limited availability of services. So um, GBMSM or gay, bi, queer, men, or sex with men in our sample experienced a lot of challenges trying to just access the services and this uh, further delayed their testing regime. So testing delays were caused by the limited number of testing sites still in operation during the early onset of the pandemic, which just made appointment scheduling very challenging. Um, Boris here had said that he had an experience uh, where he felt symptoms of a, of a particular um, sexually transmitted infection, but there was no way at the early moment, at least, to get an appointment because they were all backed up. Um, and he called several places and no one was able to get him on a, get him a test. And it was something that he really needed. Um, and then looking further here at the barriers relating to just time and availability, the limited hours of operation made it difficult for GDMSM to access um, sexual health testing services. And Jack here, you know, he says for us in Ottawa, we have this uh, specific clinic that operates only once a week. Uh, and the system was just completely overstacked. And to get an appointment, as he says here, was just ridiculous. And it took a couple of weeks. Um, and once you got there, everything was fine. But um, there wasn't enough staff, there wasn't enough folks to do the testing. And you, he could tell from his perspective that people, at least the service providers, were just very stressed. And you can feel the cumulative impact and the exhaustion of the healthcare system because of the pandemic. So moving on to the next theme, going into the changes of sexual health service preferences and practices, um, it caused a lot of disruptions and delays in people's testing routines. So the limited availability of testing services also caused those disruptions. Um, Dawson here says because of COVID, rather than getting tested at their usual uh, testing site, um, their provider simply sent the uh, requisitions. Um, but he also felt like there was a lot less testing because normally they would draw so much blood. They would, you know, get some urine samples and do the throat and rectal swabs. But when he went to his uh, appointment during the pandemic, um, it was just one urine sample, a few blood tests. So for him, it didn't feel as concrete as it normally would have. It just didn't feel as comprehensive. Um, so that major disruption and on top of the difficulties of just making an appointment made uh, a few folks just not get tested at all. Um, it was just too complicated, too hard to maneuver. 
or when they would get tested, they wouldn't get all the things they normally would due to uh, limited resources and staff in these sexual health clinics. Um, and another interesting finding actually um, was the changes in preferences and practices, particularly how GBMSM used the number of sexual partners sort of as this like benchmark for testing as well as their PrEP adherence. Um, so GBMSN had to change the number of sexual partners in their network to adhere to the provincial guidelines uh, around COVID-19 transmission at the time. And it prompted them to delay testing and stopping their PrEP use. Um, this is also an example of how GBSM in general during the pandemic had to change their risk reduction strategies. So Ian here says, uh, you know, I haven't felt the need to get tested as often because my partner isn't really sleeping with his other partners as much. Um, I've been a little less mindful uh, toward getting tested and staying on top of that stuff because the risks now are a lot lower. Um, but my partner has started to see other people again. Um, and so it's starting to creep back into my mind uh, that we should keep an eye on that. And uh, we started to talk about things like getting regular testing and potentially going on PrEP. So I want to uh, contextualize this quote in particular when we interviewed Ian. This was later on in the sort of first year of the pandemic where in Ontario things were starting to open up again. And I just thought this quote really highlighted how, you know, in the beginning there was uh, the limiting of sexual partners. And because of that, there wasn't a need to go get tested or to get PrEP. But once things started to open up again, slowly but surely, folks like Ian were starting to kind of get back into their regular regime, but still were facing many barriers and actually getting back to that normal um, that I'm sure a lot of us were trying to find during the time. And then in the last theme is looking at the transitions to virtual care. And um, one of the things that was highlighted was just how through virtual care, there were just changes in the service interactions between service users and service providers. Um, so Felix here says, the service provider literally just emailed me my blood work. I called and I was like, you know, can I have my blood work? And they emailed the blood work. <laughs> um, and he was able to take that um, emailed blood work to a lab site and it was really easy for him. Um, and, you know, originally because he didn't have like a printer um he just had to show it like on his phone like here's my lab request form and they would do it but before the pandemic um that was almost not happening or at least maybe not in all the clinics but because of the time a lot of the other clinics had to adapt to that um this like new virtual care landscape um however though it was easy for folks like Felix it's not easy for so many people. In fact, there were some challenges in navigating the virtual care landscape. So um, a few of the participants in our study uh, noted that there were some barriers just navigating the landscape, things around like language barriers, um, the lack of internet literacy being a major one, as well as the lack of access to privacy and high-speed internet for um, some of the folks we spoke with who just didn't have enough internet bandwidth or that access to actually even engage in this care. So these are folks who are falling into that sector that we, um, in the future, as researchers, policymakers, and service providers, need to also look out for when we are offering online services. So um, I'm not going to read the entire quote by Ian here, but um, you know he was he was not really familiar. Um, with this sort of process. Um, and because he has ADHD on top of that, he forgot that his um, his doctor emailed him uh, his lab requ like requisition form. And so when he ended up, when he went to the, uh, the lab, he had to go through his email history and um, the person that he initially spoke with didn't send it over the email. So it kind of caused this whole mess. And um, that was just one of the many challenges that folks had um, experienced, and this quote speaks particularly to the like uh, internet literacy and trying to figure out how a certain app works, how the emails work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and aside from that, people also had some preferences. And I think this speaks uh, a lot more to the first theme where some participants in our study 
you know, claimed that um, online services actually saved them time on receiving requisition forms and prescription renewals. They didn't have to go into the office, make an appointment first, then go talk to the doctor, get the requisition form, get the requisition form to the lab. A lot of that was cut out. And so Bailey here says that he actually enjoyed the virtual con uh, consultation that he had. He's pretty busy and getting to the office is kind of a pain in the ass, which I loved him saying. Um, and when it's something more minor, like just getting results or wanting to get information, he really appreciated being able just to have that conversation in a video conference format. So it saves folks a lot of time if they have access to, again, high speed internet, privacy, et cetera. Um, and to kind of wrap everything up, you know, what now? <laughs> and I think a service user's quote kind of encapsulates um, the impact that COVID-19 had on GBMSM's health work, you know, it was a lot of figuring it out on your own. And I like to think that, you know, this, this quote kind of transcends even not just COVID-19, but even during the AIDS crisis where so many people in our community were dying and not getting the help that they needed from the government and healthcare officials. So it kind of had to be placed on the community to try and find the ways, try to find the innovations to get the care that we need. Um, so it was interesting to see the parallels between those two um, health crises in this manner of, you know, the, the gay, bi, queer, men with sex with men, lesbians, two-spirit folks, trans folks, everyone kind of in our, in these like diverse communities needing to find their way in order to ensure that their communities get the care they, that they need and receive. Um, so all in all, GDMSM in Ontario uh, had to reconfigure their health work regimes to follow provincial mandates and to keep others in their communities safe on top of all of that. Um, they also had to navigate this new sexual health care landscape with limited knowledge and resources, depending on their social position. Um, so this also creates an inequitable landscape um, in, oh, sorry, the chat came up. Uh, it creates an inequitable landscape for GBMSM to maintain their health um, and can create more barriers to care rather than solutions. Um, so there's an opportunity now for all of us, researchers, policymakers, service providers, and community members to design and implement more innovative, accessible programs for all folks in the communities that we serve. So an example is that there's another analysis that um, our research team is looking at uh, currently, which is uh, looking at STBBI testing innovations during the pandemic from the uh, perspective of service providers that we spoke with. Um, and kind of harking back to Chris's comment about um, the recommendations and kind of preparing for the next public health crisis, I think it'd be interesting to see in terms of um, NPOX or monkeypox and how this uh, has impacted the health work of GBMSM this year. Um, collaborations, DMs are open, we can do something, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from other folks of what they uh, wanna know, whether it be health work related, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to thank you all for having me and allowing me to present today. Thank you so much, Ezra. Yeah, I think your work has really highlighted, um, you know, some of the barriers that have been introduced by COVID-19 around sexual health and testing, um, but also maybe some of the possibilities um, uh, that have been highlighted by COVID-19 around novel testing interventions. So uh, that's really exciting. Um, so I'm going to invite all of our presenters to jump back on camera because we now are in the question and discussion period. Um, and just a reminder to folks that are sitting uh, as attendees here, I uh, would love to hear any questions that you folks have uh, for our panelists um, so that we can, uh, you know, squeeze more knowledge out of them. Um, maybe while we're waiting for some questions from audience members, um, 
I guess one question for me uh, that I think you've all kind of alluded to uh, at, at the end of your presentations is just that um, like COVID is obviously not over. It's an ongoing you know, public health crisis, an ongoing health challenge for folks in our communities. So um, just like broadly to all of you folks, you know, looking ahead, what outstanding, you know, COVID-19 related issues um, are most, uh, you know, pertinent to address, I guess, within our communities um, as the pandemic continues. Well, I guess to get, get us started, um, one thing in particular that I think is pertinent uh, when we're thinking about how we can continue to support LGBT plus people as like we go on through the pandemic is, I mean, as we highlighted in our presentation, mental health is, is super important, right? So we have to consider not only, um, not only the physical health uh, or consider like public health from a systems perspective, but consider how we're how we're supporting each individual uh, and recognize the plurality of experiences that can happen uh, that that do occur uh, across people's experiences. Um, one thing that we didn't necessarily highlight in our presentation, but we talk about in, in the scope and review paper that we've written, is that we have to understand, of course, as well that the pandemic, and you kind of alluded to this as well, Ben, just even with your question, is that the, the COVID-19 pandemic is ongoing, right? So it's not to say that everybody's needs at every stage of the pandemic are going to be the same. Quite the contrary, as we've seen with vaccine rollout, uh, with lockdowns, uh, with public health measures, et cetera, you know, people's health needs uh, and social support needs have certainly changed at different phases of the pandemic. So I think that's another thing to recognize as well is that um, it doesn't make it easier per se to, to, to be continuously adapting to, you know, this reality that we're dealing with. Uh, but nonetheless, that's something I would like to accentuate as well is that we, we have to be aware of the ongoing uh, nature and the emerging new and emerging needs uh, of people within this population. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I had a, I actually have a question kind of about temporality within the scope of the pandemic too. Um, but maybe uh, before we move there, um, did others want to chime in around you know issues that maybe we need to be thinking about as the COVID nineteen pandemic continues? Yeah, go ahead, Ezra. Yeah. So I I'm speaking now. I'm taking off my research hat for a moment. I'm putting it back on my social worker hat. Um, I'm seeing a lot of clients lately and others on my team here at ACT um, are also noticing is kind of this ongoing social anxiety, whether it's directly related to like health anxiety, so like fear of getting COVID or even MPOX, um, or just kind of more in like the social realm of like, how do I interact with folks in my community in like the larger venues or bars now doing it safely and comfortably. Um, I had a client actually who were working on trying to kind of reintroduce uh, himself into society after kind of being in a lockdown um, situation for the past two years. You know, this person lives with HIV, they're immunocompromised. So, um, he understandably so has a lot of like just high anxiety around um, getting COVID because for him, even though he's like fully vaccinated, there's still always a chance to get it. And that's kind of always on his mind. And it's getting to a point now where um, friends of his who's, who's known for so long um, are now not inviting him out to places and outings because they just, from, their, from his perspective of what they've told him at least, um, just find it hard to make all the accommodations. And it's kind of this attitude of like, you just got to get over this whole COVID thing, um, which is kind of unfortunate to hear, right? Because here's a person who's like wanting to try and interact with their friends and their community more, but still want to be mindful of the fact that this pandemic is still going on. And especially in the summer with MPOX affecting uh, Toronto pretty largely here. Um, it was just really scary. So I think something that we're going to have to, as mental health professionals or even researchers, service providers, is needing to be mindful of the fact that 
there's a lot of like increased social and health anxiety um, for I think a whole swath of people more so than others. Um, and also the fact that if we're going to be providing online services that we need to make sure that they are accessible um, in a variety of formats. Um, and it's always going to be hard because every individual has very different needs and capacities to be able to engage. So, and, and we also know now that like online services are not going away anytime soon now. So if we're going to have them, we need to be like extra diligent to making sure that those services are accessible um, and helpful at the end of the day. Anyone else want to jump in before I lob another question your way? And folks, please, if you have questions, um, just throw them in the chat uh, and we'll get to them. Well, maybe one quick question for me then. Um, this is kind of like almost like a methodological question, but one thing that I like from doing a bit of COVID related work in our communities as well, um, have kind of struggled with is like making sense of these various periods of the pandemic that we've moved through and thinking about how that influences some of the data that we collect when we're um, you know, looking at studies that maybe span a few months or even a couple of years now at this point. Um, so not like a really super clear question here, but I mean, how have you accounted for, I guess, some of those um, nuances around what the pandemic looked like at various stages um, in your work? I can jump up to jump onto it. Um, I collected my data from, I believe, in December, November of 2021, which is like um, we kind of like slowing down with Delta and then going to we didn't know Omicron exists is is this. And then when I was like doing my focus group um, discussion with the participants, um, they were very hopeful, and you can see the shift of energy. Um, they say um, we're looking forward to like the the springtime and like you know the we're looking things looking forward to things opening up and then omicron happened and i can see i can also see the shift of um of the energy from the folks who participate in my studies so like oh, I, the lockdowns forever i don't see any I don't, i'm not hopeful for the future so like i can see the shift of energy throughout the data collection process throughout this i would believe like six um four or five months of me collecting data so definitely that's something I kind of look into, see how lockdowns and restrictions have a variety of different um, meanings and impact on folks. Anyone else feel like chiming in around that piece of uh, timing, periodization maybe uh, of the pandemic? Well, then maybe one one more question for me because we haven't actually had any questions from other folks that I can see at least so um I mean I've kind of alluded to this throughout but just you know all of these presentations have really highlighted uh you know intersectional equity oriented approaches to thinking about COVID-19 uh impacts um and really I think also how COVID-19 has exacerbated existing inequities in our communities um so really broad question, but what can be done to better integrate some of those intersectional insights um, into you know, our responses to the pandemic, whether those be governmental responses or community-based responses? Um, Ezra. Include voices. The not about us without us approach is still alive even today. So if like you're looking at a response and you're thinking, oh, we need more perspectives from a particular community also without tokenizing them to be um, making sure that um, is to have them just be involved, whether they're another researcher, a community member. Um, there's so much knowledge in all the things that just we do as people, um, no matter what hat we're wearing. So if like diversifying your intervention or response is a goal, 
then have those people join in the fun. And I think that's kind of the whole, that's the beauty of like the community-based approach, right? Is to really hone in that authentic engagement and involvement um, with the folks that you are studying, right? Have their voices heard, have them be part of that research paper, have them come and present in panels like these, right? Let them be the experts because they are the experts, right? Um, so include them. Don't be afraid to include folks, even if they don't have a PhD or a master's degree, right? Um, invite them in. Yeah, I think this is part of the, uh, you know, magic of community-based research and also like that really atten like attentive eye to like who is community and thinking about that in a really intersectional way, because if we just think about you know, a monolithic community, we know whose voices are going to be centered in these responses. And they're not the voices of people that really need, like, support in some respects that face these uh, intersections of oppression. So, um, yeah, others, others uh, insights around, um, you know, how we can make our responses more meaningfully intersectional. Okay, um, I think we can maybe leave things there. Uh, we did have like one last presenter, so we had a little extra time to play with uh, for this session. Um, so just want to thank you all. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters for joining us, sharing their insights uh, and uh, the results of their really great research. Uh, and thank you to um, all the folks who attended the session. Um, and uh, we hope to see you in some of the sessions tomorrow. Uh, there's also a poster viewing session um, starting at noon Pacific, uh, and we are inviting folks to provide their feedback um, on the session uh, via an evaluation. Um, and yeah, I think that's all uh, for my spiel. Uh, thanks, folks. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you, Ben, and the CBRC. Thank you. Thanks for having us present today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Likewise. much. It was a pleasure being here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.